mitigates whatever, whatever drawbacks that there might be. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, part of the uh, things that I want to do today starts off with um, a, give me one second. Uh, I lost myself. I want to stop for a second and just make sure that I have my presentation up. Here we go. Um, part of the way I want to uh, start off is by um, doing an icebreaker so that I can get to know all of you and the work that you're doing. And let me just go to my screen. And if I could just have someone tell me if you can actually see my screen, that would be great. I want to put it on presentation. Yep, looks good. Okay. Um, so one of the first things I wanted to do is just an icebreaker. Um, just again, to get to know you all. Um, I would love to know from each of you, your name, affiliation, and your project. You, know, you can just give me a description of your project or the title of your project. If you don't have a specific project, what are you broadly interested in when it comes to uh, Black digital humanities, uh, Black digital publishing? And then I like to do something that I do a lot with my students, which is Rosebud Thorn. I try to do this in the middle of the semester uh, where students often um, may be uh, having some challenges in terms of just maintaining the energy of uh, the semester. So I'd love to know um, some positive things um, and wins that you've experienced in your work in DH. Um, buds are the new ideas that you're excited to explore and share with your work in DH, Black DH specifically, or Black uh, digital publishing. And the thorns are the obstacles, problems, and challenges that you expect to face or you have faced in your work in, in DH. Um, and this will help me then be more thoughtful as I go through the presentation um, part of the uh, work today. And then as we get into some of the breakout rooms to think more in nuanced ways about the types of works that you're all doing. So um, what I'd love to do is have someone volunteer to go first and then they can popcorn it to someone else um, in the session. And, and let's all participate. I know many of you know, um, uh, Dr. Th uh, Thomas Houston, uh, as well as Dr. Graham, but I even like them to participate. Aaron, you're also part of this as well. So, um, you know, if we could have everyone participate, that would be really terrific. So if I can get someone to just start off, that would be terrific. And then popcorn it to someone else in the, in the Zoom room. I'd like to go um, oh, I so I can it. get it out of the way. Uh, you're like me. You are just like me. I, I'm the same way. Then I just sit back. But yes, that's right. Me. That's Please. right. Um, well, I'm Mbalia Thomas. Um, I'm an associate professor of TESOL at the University of Kansas. And I am very new to um, digital humanities. And I'm working on a project that's very big. But the first part of that project um, involves looking at indignation uh, letters that appear um, in some of the um, old newspapers from the mid and late 1800s. Um, uh, they're mostly Black newspapers um, that are written by some of the Black elite within Lawrence. And so I'm, I'm looking at um, literacy practices that um, surface um, during this time um, that are part of the progressive movement and I'm trying to track, you know, like some of the, the language and the features of this, of these indignation letters and, and um, where they're appearing and who they're referencing um, so that, you know, I can help document some of the very bourgeois elements of Lawrence, Kansas history um, um, following the, the Civil War. And so that's what I'm doing. But this project is just one step in a larger linguistic analysis of some of the language skills um, that surface in Black writing um, over the decades that has been lost and is rarely talked about in schools and schools of education. So that's me. Um, and then you could, you could address the growth. Uh, but and thorn, but you know, you covered a lot there. So it's up to you. 
Yeah, the thorn is that I have no clue how to do research yeah. in newspapers. I just happen to hook up with someone who does, and she's been sending me articles to, to kind of look into. And so that's been super helpful, but I'm just stumbling my way through this project. But it's really fun and exciting um, for me because I have not enjoyed living in Lawrence. And this has been the most exciting thing about being in this area is that I'm really getting to learn more about it. And as a result, I appreciate um, the town and, and, and how it likes to think about itself um, in a much more relevant way. So I hope to share this knowledge with my students and my colleagues um, and create a really interesting um, project for the world to engage with. I'm so gonna pass know, it. You know I study newspapers, right? Like, you know, I write about the black press. Uh, I do now, so oh, that's, that's, good. that's good. Yes, I, I would love to talk. That would be really helpful. Um, yeah. I've got a lot of enthusiasm, a little bit of time and less knowledge, but I'm, I'm here to learn. And so I'm just so thankful to be on this project and thinking about ways to um, find data that can be presented in a way that reflects a, a well thought out um, digital humanities project. So that's, that's my task. And you know, I spent seven years in a town that I did not like either, working at a different time. So we, <laughs> need to, we, we need to talk. We need exactly. to talk. It, it's, it's a challenge doing that. But when you find something that helps you yeah. to look at the town a little bit differently, yeah. then you think, well, hey, maybe this is one, one right. reason for my being here. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, yes, I would love, and I'll, I'll make this offer to everyone to talk to people outside of this session. And I really love how you ended your uh, overview of your work as uh, also helping to think about how to um, introduce this, this topic and these ideas to students. And again, that's where the workshop ends today was how do we take what we're working on even in its earliest forms and then translate that into pedagogy. So thank you for that. And do, who do you want to popcorn it to? Uh, Kirsten, and I hope I pronounced that right. Kirsten? Hi, I'm Kirsten um, Scott. I am a professor at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I now work in the School of Education in Language Literacy and Culture. Um, my project is connected to historically Black colleges and universities, specifically Tougaloo College. And I'm really interested in thinking about institutional narratives, so published texts about institutional histories. And um, to my knowledge, um, all, if not most, most, if not all, HBCU uh, histories are out of print. And so I'm thinking about ways that we can digitize those in order to increase access to those histories. So I'm starting with Tougaloo as a model for other HBCUs and thinking about how this increases not only public pedagogy, but institution-based pedagogy. So when I started as an undergrad at Tougaloo, I had to read the history book as an orientation project um, that every first year student had to encounter and they stopped having that in the curriculum. And I think a large part of it has to do with access to text. And I believe that digitizing those texts will not only help the institutions, but also the broader public understand and engage with HBCUs. Um, positive things that I experienced in working with Black DH's community. I think there's never been a time that I didn't like Love it. tweet something or mention something. And then someone was like, let me help you. And they actually followed through. Yes. Um, because I feel like there are several, you know, kind of subfields and areas where people are like, yeah, I'll help you. And then you end up just having this like very circular conversation that yeah. ends up nowhere. Um, so I think that the Black DH community is not small at all, but it is um, intimate and mm -hmm. that, has, I like that. has been really helpful. Um, I'm excited about where things are going now because I resigned from my position in the English department and moved to education. And mm. I feel like it's just making more sense. Yeah, yeah. The work, and I was really interested in abandoning not only the project, but academia. And so it was really just time for me to pivot, I think. Yeah. Um, and so I feel more grounded and focused and overall just like happier. So so I can do, I can do things that matter to me. Um, and that really is important for working Black DH because it sometimes was feeling like it wasn't 
the main project because I was in a yep. older traditional English yeah. department that didn't recognize it. And so it feels exciting to not have to do all of those like um, uh, gestural, yeah. like really justification for the work, yeah, like all of that and feeling like I was doing like six projects and yeah. now I can just say I'm doing this and this is why yeah. I support it. Yeah. Um, obstacles, I think, is that the kind of insider outsider positionality of I graduated from an HBCU. I feel very connected to those communities. I have a visiting assistant research professor position there. So I teach a small colloquial course um, there like once a year. Um, but even still, there are a lot of tensions of like working at a non HBCU and particularly a um, historically white research one institution and attempted to like do work across institutions and secure funding across institutions whose project is this who's helping who you know so it's a lot of kind of hidden work to make things happen um, yeah. so that has been really interesting to think about supporting um scholars at HBCUs to do this work collaboratively, but them not having the capacity and often resources to yeah. carry out the project in ways that I have by design in my position to yeah. like, of course, releases and financial support. So that has been really interesting to navigate. Kirsten, um, so you sound like me also. I pivoted from a very traditional history department um, and I had long wanted to be in Africana studies and black studies where I started at Muhlenberg College. I had a joint appointment there, but was in history for again, seven or eight years at Purdue. And now I'm back in Africana studies, which truly feels like home for me. And so I, I feel you on um, just feeling the relief of being able to do the work that you want to do. And then I have to say, Tukalu College continues to be this little hidden gem that a lot of people don't know about it until they know about it. Some of the smartest people I know come out of that institution. Small, but just liberal arts to the core is one of the places where I would love to see uh, my daughter go, one of my children go um, to school. Um, so, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, Debel Hooks, she taught there, right? Um, um I don't think I knew that, but Audrey no, Lord was there, there. and Alice there. Walker was there for a short time. Yeah, a lot of people have come through there. A yeah. lot of people have come there. I don't know if you hope to wind back there one day, but you know, it's um it's just a special, special place. So I love the idea of the Black DH community as being uh, um as intimate. And I agree with you. The DH community broadly, I think, is um antithetical to the way we are socialized and trained as academics, which is to be very individualistic, um, to be almost competitive and territorial in our work, uh, pr probably for good reasons if you, you know, are trying to publish and you're on that tenure track. But it's DH broadly, and then specifically Black DH, where I have found community and the type of collaborative work and sharing um, that has sustained me in the academy. I don't know that I would have continued to be in the academy if it wasn't for Black DH um, specifically, because it's where I, you know, continue to find home um, and, you know, a certain level of safety in terms of, you know, intellectual ideas and projects. So I, I really, really feel you on that. Uh, before we move forward, Mariam, um, Marilyn, Aaron, I'm going to have to say you guys are probably not going to do the icebreaker because I really do want to get to know uh, the rest of the, uh, the scholars, um, and, but also have time for the session. So, uh, Kirsten, who do you want to popcorn into? Um, I'll popcorn to Jacinta. Okay. Um, my name is Jacinta Saffold. I am a, I am very recently the uh, endowed chair for Africana Studies at the University of New Orleans. Nice. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm also on uh, leave for this year. I am on a Louisiana Board of Regents Atlas grant to uh, work on my first book. I um I first met you, Kim, I don't know if you remember, but uh, a really long time ago, a few years ago at Purdue, you had a conference um, sponsored by the Mellon Foundation on Black Digital Humanities. I uh, attended that conference and it was there that I realized that what I was doing 
what I had done for my dissertation work was in the realm of digital humanities and that there was so much more that I could do with my work. Yeah. Um, and so since then, I have been developing the Essence Book Project, yeah. which is a computational collection of the uh, the titles ranked on the bestsellers list published in Essence Magazine from 1994 to 2010. I also am a um, member of the Society of Fellows in Critical Bibliography and have spent the summer taking classes at the Rare Book School at the University of Virginia. Mm -hmm. And one thing that these classes has taught me is one, it's given me a, a lot of FOMO with librarians and <laughs> I'm considering um, how I can uh, reposition what I do on a day-to-day -day basis to uh, include more um, library work, especially uh, curatorial work. Yeah. Um, but also it has shown me that the things that I have done um, manually because I, I needed access to these things for my own research purposes um, are, are easily automated in, in ways that, that just highlight the barriers between um, African American studies and digital humanities. A lot of the things that I've, I, a lot of the the things that I've done manually uh, can be easily done with codes, but I don't know how to code, and so yeah. it, it's a really difficult thing. And it, it was very frustrating because the courses are uh, about a week long. And it's just enough to show you that you've been doing it wrong, but not enough to show you how to do it the right way. Right. And I'm, I'm in the deep south and my at a state uh, regional institution where we lack um, digital infrastructure simply due to, you know, the a barrage of hurricanes that we receive. Right. Right. Um, so it, we, we don't we don't have any kind of infrastructure there. There aren't um, people that I can go to and, and work in community with when I get stuck on different um, aspects of, of advancing this project. So I'm really excited to be a part of this cohort for that very reason, to have access to scholars and other practitioners in digital humanities who can help me when I get stuck. Nice, nice. Um, so much of what you're saying is so interesting to me. Uh, and it's nice seeing you again. And you're, you know, I've been following your work and your work is amazing. And what you're doing with Essence is truly innovative. Um, and I liked, and you'll see this in the workshop, um, that relationship that you are charting between um, libraries and archives and, and DH, and then also the relationship between DH and African-American studies, which is obviously, you know, considerable overlap, but also have sort of distinct trajectories. And to my delight, I just, I think, just in this last couple of years, I'm starting to see African American studies and, and Black DH speak more to each other, and I expect that to to change even more so as uh, you know more uh, emerging scholars and teachers come into the field, um, seeing themselves as, as Black digital humanists. But again, I think that the the session today, which is foundationally about Black collection building and its relationship to Black digital publishing. I think is really key and, and, and important um, for you. So popcorn it to someone else and then um, I wanna get started as soon as we can. Uh, I'll popcorn it to Amanda. Okay. Hi, good morning y'all. Thank you so much for um, sharing your knowledge with us, Dr. Gallen. Oh, please call me Kim. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Um, so I'm Amanda, I'm currently at Duke University. I'm a six year literature PhD student. And my project is um, developing an archive of videos that basically condense seminal text and Black feminist thought into mm -hmm. one to three minute videos. And I typically analyze them through the lens of Black feminism, psychoanalysis, um, self-care, mental health. Mm -hmm. And I've been posting them so far on TikTok and Instagram, but I want to create a database that teachers can easily draw on to just play one of my videos in class uh, and share with students. Nice. I definitely want to get in touch with you. I'm teaching Black Feminism at uh, Brown this semester, and it is the uh, Black Feminism Politics of Care. So your project sounds amazing to me, just as as a pedagogical, um, you know, a pedagogical approach, both of its content as well as the strategy of using digital technologies. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, that sounds like an incredible class. Yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely have to be in touch. Um, I'll come, if I can come back to you a little bit more um, with the rose and thorn towards the end of the uh, presentation, um, that would be great, but I wanna move forward just so that we can get started. So um, who's, who wants to go next? 
Hi, my name is Coco Williams. Um, I am a senior lecturer at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, my project is entitled Looking for the Museum in Early African American Literature. And um, this DH project is an extension of some of the work that I've been doing um, in my dissertation. And um, one of the things that um, I just found insightful about what you said, Kim, about how um, um, I, I realized how much my project, um, which was, you know, a very traditional dissertation, lended itself to um, DH applications. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I've been tracking, um, using keywords um, as metadata, like mentions of both art pieces and museum spaces, both traditional and non-traditional in African-American literature, mm -hmm. and, and trying to make this argument about um, how Black writers have engaged with spectatorship um, yeah. through their characters. Um, and I found some like, super rich uh, um, connections there, um, especially looking at um, how DH visualizations can help uh, enhance those, those stories. Um, so that's what I'm working on. Nice. I guess you um, probably are really engaged with uh, Kenton Ramsey's work then and how he visualizes mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, data uh, and text as data. Mm -hmm. um, I think his work continues to be, continues to be brilliant. Um, and I think, Sandra, are you the last person, but not least? <laughs> I think so. Hi, everyone. I'm Sandra Bickham Washington. I'm assistant professor of American literature at Wilkes Harris College of Florida Atlantic University. Mm -hmm. And my project is the Black Girlhood Project. Mm. I'm interested in the ways that we perceive and ignore um, simultaneously Black girls, um, specifically um, African American female children and adolescents, and um, the way that we kind of um, merge their identity with Black womanhood. Yeah. And so I am um, attempting to create a resource that will um, kind of um, support the growing field of Black girlhood studies, uh, because I find that people um, make generalizations about Black girlhood in yes. literature in particular. And as I was been reading, I've noticed that um, we are I don't know if that's based on fact. And so I'd like to provide a resource that helps us to um, kind of inform um, more broadly our ideas of Black girlhood and the ways that they are represented in um, literature in particular. Um, one of the uh, struggles, well, with the roses, right? The positive things is that this is exciting. And um, as the mother of a young Black woman, you know, now I, when she was a child, it was really, um, exciting to know that I could be a part of helping people to kind of um, support and to um, to protect Black girls. Um, one of the buds is I'm just really excited um, about this work, probably so excited that I have created a thorn and that I want to do too many things oh. and not, and it's really difficult to kind of yeah. narrow it down. Yeah. And I'm also in a position where I'm very isolated being not only at an honors college, um, but like one of two literature professors in this particular honors college. Mm -hmm. And so I don't really have um, a lot of support in the work that I'm doing, nor do I think that they really uh, understand what I'm attempting right. to do to offer me the kind of support that will be helpful, especially as a person on the tenure track, so. Got it, yeah. Yeah, uh, isolation, intellectual academic, academic isolation is real. That's one of the reasons why um, I developed the Black Press Research Collective just to create a larger community of people that were interested in the Black press and um, the digital humanity. So I, I definitely understand that. Um, so it's really a pleasure to meet all of you. I mean, your work and your projects are incredibly interesting and innovative. Um, I definitely would like to be engaged with each of you individually and collectively. Um, and so I think the way I want to proceed, Erin, I was going to do breakout sessions. I think we have a nice intimate community of people now that we don't really need that. Um, the uh, works, uh, workshop or webinar really will be interactive throughout 
Um, what I'd like to encourage, um, I think, uh, uh, can I call you Coco or um, I think yes. maybe if you could mute, because I'm just getting oh, a little I'm so feedback. sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay. Um, what I'd like to do is encourage you to, uh, when you want to, either during the chat, in the chat, or just verbally engage some of the ideas I'm going to talk about over the next few minutes. And then I want to pose some questions to you. Um, I have two video exchanges I want to share with you. Um, Dr. Graham doesn't know this, but we had an incredible exchange a few weeks ago. She uh, uh, indulge me and was so generous of her time. I was interviewing her about the history of Black Writing Project. And, you know, we just, there's so many gems in that conversation. I want to share one of them with you, but use that to engage you in some serious inquiry around what it means to uh, to build a Black collection and be a Black collection builder, which I see all of you as being part of that work. And then I had the pleasure also to speak with um, Mr. Howard uh, Dotson, who was the longtime director of the Schomburg. Um, he also has some ideas and thoughts to share about what it means to have a Black consciousness when you're building a collection. And I'd like to share a bit of that conversation with you also, hoping to engage you about the sort of um, epistemologies that might be at the basis for the work that we do. Um, but I want to get us started by thinking about collections as data. Um, so Thomas Padilla, who is a deputy director of archiving and data services at the Internet Archive, I think that's his new position. I hope I got that right. If I don't, um, please, you know, let me know or Google him. But he's been really big on this idea of collections as data. And he calls on us to consider the implications of shifting our thinking about digital library collections as data, quote, order information stored digitally that are amenable to computation. And he writes, uh, quote, that the value of such a shift can be explored in part by asking how thinking about an object as data multiplies and or extends the questions that can be asked. And I've really been thinking about this uh, idea of collections as data. It's a big thing in the library world, um, big thing in digital humanities, particularly around literary text. And I don't disagree with it at all. Um, but what I always am concerned about in doing any type of work, particularly in the digital humanities and technologies, is the way that people tend to continue to talk about technology and data collections as sort of uh, these objective, um, neutral categories without thinking about the politics, the socio politics that are at the basis of them and, and, and um, influence these things. So one of the questions that I am interested in and asking and thinking about uh, both with you and, and, and work that I'm doing right now is expanding this idea of collections as data. How do we understand, understand the significance of CAD our collections as, as data and what lies in the space between the digital collection and the data set, right? So that when we think about, you know, digital collections and how they become data, you know, what happens in that process? What are the sort of spaces or the intricacies in between that um, and how they speak to various uh, ideas uh, broadly? Um, my ideas that I'm talking about are much more specific to race. Um, and gender um, and other intersections, but more specifically to race if we're thinking about Black DH and Black digital praxis. And then what are the areas of knowledge that remain illegible to computer programs that are bound up in digital collection building, particularly a Black digital collection building? So just since I want to go back to something that you said, and that's why I think these um, introductions are worth um, spending some time on, even as I take up a little bit of the time of our session, because you talked about being at an institution that doesn't have the digital infrastructure and, and how that may have limits. I hope I understood what you said um, and feeling as though you've been doing things wrong or doing things maybe in a way that it doesn't best serve the project. Can you just nod if I, if I captured that, right? And I hear you, and that certainly has been some of the, the thorns, if you will, that I've, I faced in first working at a small liberal arts college that had virtually little 
digital infrastructure or technological infrastructure to support the work. It's one of the reasons I left Muhlenberg College as well as Lamar's College in Pennsylvania and went to Purdue was sheer for the sheer resources. I mean, I definitely did not want to move to Indiana, but move there um, with the understanding that I would be able to do the work that I wanted to do much more with the resources that they had technologically, but also the financial resources. But at the same time, I want to be I want to be careful here because um, some of the things that you are doing, Jacinta, with the work on Essence, it may be, uh, you know, doing by hand, if you will, because you don't know how to code. I would argue actually is important work and actually um, is that at that space and that area of knowledge that may be lost if you're just solely working with a digital technology, right? All of that is to say that um, I think particularly when we're working with Black collections, there are these spaces in between sort of um, sort of the manual labor, right, uh, that you might be doing and the coding that is really incredibly important that you can only get if you are working very closely with these collections. So this is not to, um, you know, eschew digital infrastructure and the power that comes with coding, but it is also to say that there's something incredibly valuable by having uh, a firsthand, really intimate knowledge of this collection of essence that you're working with that may not be available to you if you're solely working with digital uh, technologies and infrastructure. So I'll come back to that in a second. So the life of collections as data is embodied and sociopolitical and cultural, right? Um, and we need to think about the cultural life of collections and the processes of transformation into digital objects or into data sets, right? That collections come with a history, collections come with a politics, collections come with a culture, collections come with a whole set of ideas. They are not neutral. They are not these objective standalone things that sort of miraculously or spontaneously sort of uh, appear to us, right? And in fact, if we think about collections of, as, as data, we have to think and make sure that we understand that data is race, Data is always political, data is never neutral. And if we think about data as race, certainly we must think about data as being black. So in the work that I do, um, I try as much as possible to be very specific and very, very precise. Obviously blackness falls under the broad sort of category of what we understand as race as a construction. But to me, blackness uh, is a much more specific and precise way of understanding race. And I will push back against anyone, anytime with real empirical evidence to suggest that, you know, race as a category was invented for black people. So we cannot understand anything about race until we understand blackness and the way that blackness has been made and remade um, in order to both liberate, but also to oppress black people. So individual, uh, digital objects and data collections are race, if we're thinking about black collections generally, and then you know black more specifically. So if we're thinking about collections as data and we're thinking about the black collection as data, we have to start off with thinking about blackness and we have to start off thinking about data as being race and as, as having, um, as being black, if you will, right? Both in, um, both in the sort of political sense, but also in the sense of how people interact or are represented by data. So a lot of this is coming from my work with Black Beyond Data, a project I've been working with a team at Johns Hopkins when we think about um, the specificity of Black uh, data and the ways it both challenges it, challenges and expands traditional data science. And I can talk more about that if people wanna ask questions towards the, the end of uh, my comments. But we can't understand anything about collections as data, and I would argue black digital publishing until we start thinking about black collection building, right? Before you can even think about publishing your work as a digital collection, as a black digital collection, I think you have to understand the praxis of building a, co a collection, a black analog collection, right? And that the act of building is neither neutral nor objective, right? And I don't care who the collection builder is, 
I don't care, care what they're building, their act of selecting and building and curating and archiving is never neutral. There is always a set of politics, both good, bad, and ugly. And so when you are doing this work of Black digital publishing and creating your Black DH projects, I think you have to understand, um, which I think all of you obviously already do, because I think it's sort of, um, for, me, for most people who are doing this work, it's sort of hardwired into us to think about the work we're doing these very nuanced and very specific uh, ways. Uh, but I would like to sort of just give you a couple examples of a Black collection um, praxis that we see happening across time and place. There's a lot of examples I could give. Um, I've just picked out two really quickly and some of the more well-known ones with Arturo Schomburg. Lauren Helton's work has just been pioneering in in this instance, both on um, Schomburg and Dorothy Porter Wesley, who I'll present in a second. But she argues that Schomburg humanized collection building through a strategic order of recovery operations that had evaluated archival documents for their ability to redress the harm wrought by enslavement and legacy, enslavement and the legacy of enslavement, right? So Schomburg in building his collection, the collection that we have today that we benefit from today in the Schomburg uh, research um, section of the New York Public Library is that he was engaging in a radical set of praxis that was humanizing uh, collection building as a radical way of recovering black people's lives. It was never just about collecting materials that people could just uh, read or sit um, in a uh, institution without people engaging it. It was a way to um, evaluate or to make a case for the archival documents, right? To redress the harm, to bring black people into existence through, through the collection, right? And that remains, I think, the, the sentiment of the Schomburg today and many other black collections, and certainly when uh, Howard Dotson was running the Schomburg, he brought that same uh, impulse and that same sentiment as you will see um, in the video conversation I had with them to, to that work. Um, so black collection building uh, counter stories of privilege and power. It begins from the premise that not all collections are created equally. I think that's incredibly important. You know, the Schomburg continues in the whole scheme of things as well known internationally as it is, it still uh, suffers from the fact that it is a black collection, right? It still suffers from the idea that and the, its physical presence in Harlem, again, even with its international acclaim and significance, it can't, le uh, it can't um, lose that. And, and Dr. Graham talks about this um, in our conversation, again, which you'll see in a few minutes, about not being able to lose that um, that that sense of blackness in the pejorative sense, right? We all see blackness obviously in a much more liberatory, uh, uplifting, powerful, affirming sense, but the broader world, right, continues to see blackness in the pejorative as in the problem. So that when I say all collections are not created equally, um, they come from um, you know, a, a, a deficit in, in the sense of how the world sees them, even as the Black collection builder sees them um, much more in, in the affirmative, right? And so just in that sense, we have to understand that the collection, if you think about collections as data, you know, the collection in its initial formulation is not thought of as uh, equally, or there's not equity built into that. So certainly that relationship or that idea in the process of turning that collection into the data also continues to carry that with it. I hope that makes sense. And again, Dr. Graham says this much more beautifully than I do. And I'll, I'll be able to share her comments in a second to bring this into a little bit more concrete, um, concreteness. Um, you know, Dorothy Porter Wesley, you know, a long time uh, librarian Howard, this man's a tool she learned in library school to reclassify and organize materials of a logic of blackness and how black communities might understand collections. Again, Lauren Helton has just been amazing in recovering her work and thinking critically about her, her, uh, her strategic and methodological approach to library information science. 
Um, she argued that Porter's work highlights a distinctly Black praxis of collection building that establishes conduits between different sites of Black textuality, right? Black textuality being the text itself, but the textuality also being the way that these uh, the collection is organized and un understood and, and creating new classification systems that decolonize uh, the ways that collection and library information science understands it from a very Eurocentric uh, point of view. So again, my, my, my comments here are to, again, get us to think about the Black collection, the practice of a Black collection as a foundational principle of Black digital humanities, albeit when we get to the Black digital collection takes on a new forms, but doesn't lose the politics and the, the impetus of what it means to build a Black collection. So Black collection building recovers lost Black text and retrofits European-centered information infrastructure into classifications that are much more conducive to Black print or the Black digital collection. So, you know, you can put Black digital objects in that also. So again, all collections are not created equally, right? Before you can even build a Black collection, you have to sort of tear down infrastructure that was never built or created for Black collections, right? Um, for Black communities to understand these collections. So, you know, as we all do, um, and I think, um, I think it was Kirsten that said this, um, maybe Mbalia said this also, but I imagine all of you could say this, the work that the Black Digital human, Humanist does is, um, okay, I'm biased, but I would say it's deeper. Uh, profound, but also there's more labor to it, right? Because we can't just sort of walk into the digital infrastructure that's been created for a uh, for European center projects and ideas and just sort of walk into them naturally. We walk into them understanding the discomfort, even when they benefit us, right? So, you know, I'm thinking about data science and how, um, you know, I, I'm not one to um, say, let's get rid of data science. No, there's value in data science, but I also have to live with the, 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 the knowledge and the praxis of data science that is oppressive and try to figure out the ways to make it work for the work that I'm doing, even as I'm rejecting other parts of it and trying to rebuild what it means to work with uh, data about Black people. Same thing with the Black digital uh, collection and the Black digital uh, humanities projects, we are walking into technological infrastructure that is really not built in many ways for Black people's liberation, but we need to use them because there's benefit to these, even as we understand that some of the technological infrastructure um, does not serve us, serve us or does not, uh, is not in service to the work that we want to ultimately do. So the Black collection, again, the Black digital collection, I would argue also serves as a counter narrative of white supremacy. It recovers and locates Black people in history as a people with history. Black librarians and bibliographers recognize the work as being integral to humanizing Black people. Shonda Walker, the Associate Director for Instruction Research College, uh, research, uh, Georgia College writes, the Black collection is not just mere assemblage of books and manuscripts, but a weapon in centuries old war for recognition of Black humanity, right? And so I, I, you know, librarians, when, which I used to be a librarian, I was a bibliographer for a few years at the University of Penn. And I certainly uh, walked into that position very much understanding the special role that a Black bibliographer has. Right, the obligation, if you will, that the Black bibliographer has um, in collecting and building a collection that's going to be a weapon um, in oppression and a, a tool for the recognition, recovery, and I would add, uh, add to that the re restoration of, of Black humanity. So Black digital collection is related in the sense that it is um, does a lot of the same things that the Black a collection does as a practice, but it's also distinctly invested in critiquing race neutral and depoliticized understandings of digital tools and technologies at the site of democratization of knowledge and the humanities. And that's the trouble I have with collections as data, right, is that it continues to sort of operate out of this idea that collections are race neutral, 
that collections as data, you know, sort of this process of turning the collection into larger data sets for computational analysis is an unproblematic process. And I will trouble that process, and I'm in trouble in really positive ways to say that it is not a, a neat, neutral process. It's a process that's wrought with a lot of um, politics of race and white supremacy um, and racism, both in the people that are, are doing the work and writing about the work and being funded for the work, but also the fact that you're starting with this idea that collections are race neutral and are created equally. And so the Black digital collection praxis, you know, troubles that idea and is invested in critiquing this idea of race neutral and depoliticized understandings of technology. You know, Jessica Johnson, Associate Professor of History at Johns Hopkins, which I know all of you probably know her work, both in her work on, on women in, in enslavement, but also in the digital humanity, says that, you know, quote, Black digital practice or practice like Black freedom struggles does not operate isolated from broader struggles against systemic violence and dehumanization. It's one of the things I love about being a Black studies scholar is that we show up in these spaces ready to talk about race and politics broadly, right? Um, ready to do the work, but also understand that our work is always, and I hope this, this sentiment is shared here. I, I, I feel like it is. I'm talking to you know, a group of, of Black women. Um, our work is always distinctly connected to Black people's lived lives um, in some shape, form, or fashion. So, so many of us in the, in the academy, whether we're working at an HBCU, but particularly when we're working at predominantly white institutions, understand that we are doing this labor and are struggling to do this labor, both for what it might do intellectually, but what it might be able to do for Black people's lives in the the day to day. And that doesn't always line up, particularly when your institution does not share that same point of view. We, we walk into these spaces uh, again in, with discomfort, trying to fit into places that were not meant for us, determined to do the work that we want to do um, that's going to have real meaning um, and our challenge as well as fulfilled in doing that, that type of work. So Black collections as data you know, I and this is where I'd like to have a bit of a conversation before I move to um, Dr. Dotson and then Dr. Graham's uh, conversation. Um, technological innovations open up new and different ways that Black collections can be analyzed, a computational analysis, and other digital tools. But does this alienate, in some sense, Black scholars and students to the radical ideas behind collection building? You know, when we talk about breaking, you know, DH. Um, particularly in the literary field, is uh, invested in sort of breaking down you know, text into pieces for computational analysis, right? Um, to do text mining, to do visualization, to do network analysis. Again, all really, really important work. But I think a fundamental principle of Black DH is about a holistic uh, collection building and thinking about the wholeness of a collection. So I'm not suggesting that you can't break down the text uh, in different collections to then rebuild it and create a holistic sort of idea of it. But I do wonder about the ways that we um, push technological innovation as breaking things down to analyze, which I think is a very Western, Western praxis, quite frankly. Uh, as a way of thinking about getting to some objective truth. What I think fundamentally collection building has been about holistic recovery and creating collections that are interoperable with black communities. So I'm using a, a, a computer technology question, uh, 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 um, word uh, and process, interoper interoperability meaning, you know, the sort of seamless sort of connections between different systems. I like to think it's Black DH is trying to create interoperability between Black communities and Black digital humanities and Black digital collections, creating a relationship where these, these uh, entities, these communities, and these things can speak to each other. I think that's what's been valuable about Black DH. And I wonder about the push to always break things down, to analyze them as being antithetical to Black DH. So um, if we could just talk about that for about five minutes, um, I'd love to, to have a conversation about how that sort of uh, resonates with you or anything else I've said so far. I'm going to stop sharing so I can actually take a look at all of you. And I'm going to set the timer on five minutes just so that we can 
be um, conscious of the rest of it, the rest of the time. Uh, I'll kick it off, uh, Kim, um, just with one point. Um, we actually were very conscious of this when we named the project the Black Book Interactive Project, so that staying away from the word digital consciously and embracing it in this holistic manner was important. And we thought we could signal that with different terminology. So the interactive is, you know, across multiple, uh, uh, you know, domains. It's the scholars themselves, scholars and community, scholars um, and in, in, in variety of settings so that you are much more uh, intra intercultural in your operational practices. Um, and that has turned out to be interesting because we are partnering with Behind the Scenes Project, which is almost holistic, completely librarian driven uh, and recovering doing work. So, so I do think that awareness has to be upfront and central. That yeah, if, I love this. And I didn't know that uh, with making sure it's a black book interactive project as, as opposed to digital, right? I think that those sort of uh, approaches and those choices are incredibly important because I think it speaks to uh, a legacy of Black collection building and a legacy of, of Black intellectual work that has been invested in recovery, right? I mean, part of the Black experience is, you know, and I'm thinking about, you know, enslavement and the first thing that Black people do when they, quote, get freedom is they're trying to recover lost ones, right? They're going back or they're going south, right? As opposed to, you know, going north or going places where people might have associated with more freedom to recover lost people. So I think there's something very essential and very core about this idea of recovery and holistic um, impulses of bringing and piecing things together that I do wonder um, about the broader digital humanities um, sort of world um, and how it doesn't always speak to the Black digital humanist who is really thinking to me often, and I'm not trying to speak for all of you, but who are thinking in more holistic ways and, and the radicalness of uh, this holistic idea as it relates to technology. We have two minutes. I'd love to hear a couple of other people. And I know Jacinta, you had uh, something in the chat that I, I didn't know if you want to speak to. Yeah, my, my internet is very unstable right now, but I, I absolutely, um, the, these are things um, that have been frustration points. And uh, I um, was a, a diversity administrator for a few years because I, I had grown frustrated with um, the lack of, of, of infrastructure around the, the subjects that I wanted to pursue in my research and knowing that the collections that exist um, were not, were created for to support the kind of work that I, I deem as important and relevant to um, Black communities. And, and so even just like the ways that I had to go and collect each issue of the Essence Book uh, project, a lot of times though the page that had the list was not collected in uh, what was in, in the microfiche or whatever, however I was accessing it because it was deemed as uh, not important because it was put in with the advertisements at the back of the magazine. And so the, the kinds of priorities that the people who are making the decisions on how, not even what should be collected, but how they they become collected is such a fraught situation. And, and I thought that it was this, I was in a kind of unique, position to have these sorts of frustrations. So I thank you for voicing that it's not just me. No, thank you for beautifully articulating and giving a very concrete example, right? So that's what I mean about this interoperability. Like you are coming from a, a, a black sort of lived experience, but I would say a deeply sort of black epistemological experience, uh, praxis also, and thinking about, um, you know, first of all, what's collected, how it's collected, how it's curated, that um, if you um, are outside of that experience, um, you don't have the same sort of sentiment or the same sort of approach. So that's exactly, you know, exactly what I mean. And actually, again, the notion of 
um, first of all, a couple of things you said, sort of the, again, building the collection, um, coming from a holistic, recovering that work, right? Understanding that what you're doing is a, a sort of a radicalness around um, building, um, you know, recovering and then building and creating a, a system that speaks much more to the Black community. So again, I really, really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to share a screen again, just so that we can um, continue to move on. Oh, and um, Crystal had her hand up as well. Oh, sure. Crystal, please. Oh, please, getting my screen up. Oh, hi, Dr. Gallen. So sorry, I entered at the tail end of introductions, but I, I was going to say that your point about like the impulse of the Black digital humanist really resonates with me. If I think about it, all of my questions are animated by recovery as a theme. And, and I'm thinking about um, my project, how we recover histories of Black literacy against racist data collection methods of the census, right? And so really for me, the project is, uh, the or the, the struggle is how, how can the digital serve, right? To answer those questions and how do I interact with the digital in that way? So just your points are really resonating around these, the, the kind of what it means to be a black study scholar and come to this work and how we approach the research. So I just wanted to say, I appreciate those points. Thank you, thank you so much. And I, get, I have a, in front of um, us now, just again, what I had just uh, sort of mentioned. And I'm, I'm writing a piece on this now, um, which, again, which is why I'm talking to Dr. Graham was incredibly important a few weeks ago, because I really wanted to, uh, I really wanted to get in the sort of mind of a black digital collection builder, right? An architect, uh, the architect, one of the, the primary foundational architects, in my opinion, who still is under-recognized and undervalued of a Black digital collection, right? So I, I think in 100 years, we're going to be talking about Dr. Graham and the way that we talk about Dr. Schomburg today. I know that I won't be around 100 years from now, but we will be as being a pioneer in building a, a collection, a digital collection. Uh, we'll be talking about her the way that people are talking about Dr. Porter Wesley and her and the radicalness. So I, you know, I say that um, to help you appreciate uh, the significance of the work that she's been doing since 1983. Um, and I know I'm running out of time, so um, I'll, this will be recorded and I'll share the slide deck with you. So you're more than welcome to hear the conversation with Dr. Dodson or Mr. Dodson, but I really want you to hear this exchange between uh, Dr. Graham and I. Uh, you'll see my excitement in this moment of talking to her because she just blew my mind and thinking about what it means to recover uh, a, a lost literary text. So if you'll indulge me, um, I want to play just um, about um, a little bit less than 10 minutes, a little over 10 minutes of our, our conversation. And, it, and I, I promise you it, it's worth it. And then we'll have a, a conversation about it. Um, let me just pull this up. Switching gears a little bit. When I first went to American Literary Society, years ago, first went to Boston, I did the first year before I started teaching. I looked at the last person to read a check out the books I was using. Uh-huh. Now, Marcus, Marcus McCarson was still hanging around the American Antiquarian Society. He had been the big founder. I right. knew that he knew um, um, the librarian at Howard University. They were good friends. And she would get him to buy books that Howard could not afford. Mm. Dorothy Porter Wesley. Yes. And I stumbled upon, which is where Gate Skip knows, I stumbled upon the copy of Our Nig with Dorothy Porter's inscription, this is a Black writer, mm. before Skip recovered the book. Wow. She had told Marcus McCarson to buy this book. It needs to be preserved, wow. but it costs too much money, and we can't afford it. But you need to have it in the American Antiquarian Society, and that's where it was. So in my research, I noticed how little people had used these books I was looking at. Right. So I did a checklist of the books. I think I still have a copy of it as my, because you know, when you get those fellowships, you got to do a presentation. Right, right. My presentation was a checklist of African-American holdings in the American Antiquarian Society between one year and a, between certain years. Uh -huh. And all, and the only reason I put those things in the checklist, books that nobody had been looking at. Uh -huh. So 1946, and I'm there in 1985. Right, 40 years. 
Nobody's looking at this stuff. Access. Nobody is looking at accessing this material so that you can include that in your analysis of something. Right, right, so right, right. If, right. if people doing collections, creating collections, finding aids, the whole bit, if you don't pay attention to the whole kit and caboodle, yes. then you will have people 40 years, 50, 60, 70 years, never looking at something. Right, right. If the description doesn't enable that, facilitate that. Yeah. And if you're not gonna do, you're not gonna dig any deeper. Yeah. You're not gonna do what Nicole Brown did, like, okay, what we're doing doesn't work, so let's make up something and make it work. Right, right. Let's tweak it. Yeah. Maybe we do this. Who's gonna do that? We do it all the time. We always tweak it. Right, right. But we're often we're not in the positions of power or to do it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or like that what Uncle Nearest, that, that liquor in bourbon in uh in Tennessee, when Uncle Nearest gave the, the his slave owner the, the formula for the liquor. Yeah, <laughs> and, right. and now the family sues and now they get it back. <laughs> you know, right. they get it back. They now own it. Now, Uncle right. Nearest is a brand of liquor because it was his formula that created it, but he sold it to his, he gave it to his plantation owner. He made him right. filthy rich. Yeah, and erased him his whole erased him. The best yeah. kind of reparations there is, there is. But so we do have to pay attention to that. I do think, I mean, I think that, you know, I want to say this, come, this in my mind is a collections workshop only. Yeah. For people to think about yes. how you do this. What is your goal? Is it a mechanical process? Right, right. Thinking about it is the way in which you give humanity greater possibility. Yes, yes, for yes. understanding, for communicating, right, for transforming, right, for building a more democratic society, right, right, for understanding across all these barriers perceived and real. Yeah. And so the role of archives is just really crucial, but you got to create them. Yeah. That they don't just sit in dusky locations. Right, which is traditionally how it's that right. knowledge has and been. I, and I was the generation of librarians who are very protective. Yes, Don't yes. You. So it really stopped that preservation. Yeah, it stops the preservation. And so yeah. in the very beginning, when our librarians didn't want us to digitize books, we said, can you do it for us? Yeah. If you don't want us to do it. We'll do it. We will write you into the grant. <laughs> that's what we do we will write you into the grant yeah. so you do that part for us yeah and then we have it and we have yeah. a partner in our library yeah. yeah you know i'm the deal maker right <laughs> well, you're our partner your name is going to be on everything that goes out yeah and we get the stuff digitized that we need right because that is ultimately at the end of the day you know so we, we keep looking um we have a meeting tomorrow. I'll give you the latest data, but this young okay. woman, I mean, she's doing, she's looking everywhere, getting the information. We feed it to her. She does the searches. Right. And, and like I said, every week, we just get a whole new group. At least, I'm, I'm sure it's 135, 150 every, every single week. She has found new titles. Yeah. And it's just, the scale is just jumping up. But well, we, right. yeah, because we didn't stop. We didn't stop. Mm. We didn't stop recovering work. Skip. Right. I differ because he made his mark in an important moment of recovery, but he didn't continue to do that. And, and, and the thing that I, that's one of the big, big, big takeaways for me out of this, which I kind of knew, but really, really didn't know, is that recovery is not retrospective. Right. That's and, right. And that, right. That's it. Like, what, uh, you know, I've been thinking about HBW as a retrospective, like we're going to recover these lost works. But works can be lost as soon as they make it out in the world. There, there's a sense of loss because of especially a, historical exclusion is going to follow you wherever you go. Yes, yes. You can't get rid of that. There's no way you to can't get, get rid of that. You can't get rid of that. You have to take yeah. it with you and wear it all the time. Yes, 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 so yes. Put it in the front of you. It should. Lead, you should lead with the fact that if we don't do it a certain way. It will be ex historically excluded yet again. But HBW, what's the power of HBW is you anticipate yes, erasure. Exactly. 
That's right. Before exactly. it happens, you're there to catch it because I know this is going to be a race because right. you are a black author, you are yeah. self-published, or your book is at a, a small press somewhere, and yeah. you anticipate the erasure, and you catch these books in the moment to to, to halt that yeah. in real yeah. time. That's yeah. amazing to me. Yeah, and it's and a, it's, a, it's a way of talking about black digital humanity in a way that I have been really thinking about Black DH in the way that it is on the ground, in the moment, responding to crises. And yes. you're responding to the crises of the Black writer that is perpetual because of structural racism. And so by catching the Black writer in the moment and their text in the moment, you are forestalling the crisis of, of erasure that is sure to happen without an intervention in that time. Yeah. Yeah. Mary, Emma, I... I mean, I should have talked to you years ago. Okay, I'll stop it there. But you guys could see how excited I was to talk to Dr. Graham about this because uh, I'll stop sharing for a second. Um, because what she was charting to me and thinking about the Black uh, collection and the building of a Black collection, the radicalness of it, of it's not just, you know, assembling things, right? It is anticipating retrospectively, but also in the moment and in the future, how without the intervention of the black collection builder, the black digital humanist, the black digital collection, um, you know, archivist, archivist, um, that without their intervention, um, the crises of, of being lost, right? Of being invisible, being misrecognized, of being dis guarded or disregarded um, and discarded um, without that work, um, we run the risk of again um, losing you know a, an incredible amount of work scholarship and again um, dehumanizing black people. So I, I hope that you know in that little exchange you sort of got what I was hoping you could get out of that and what I'd like you to do um, again let me just bring this up. Um, is to think about your own work for a minute and uh, talk, and again, like three or four minutes, how, uh, how does your work respond to a particular crisis of Black humanity in the moment? But, and it could be historically, but also in the moment. And when I say crises, you know, I'm using that language uh, a little bit loosely, but all of you talked about your work as making some sort of sort of intervention as recovering something or, or bringing something back together. And then if you want to also add to that, you know, what is the responsibility of the Black digital publisher, publication humanist to serve as a counter narrative uh, to do this work of recovery? Is it the, the obligation that we might talk about with the with Houston, um, uh, Houston Hughes and the sort of the the obligation of the Black writer or Du Bois and the, the obligation of the Black artist? Are we running into that same debate and discussion about the responsibility of the, the humanist that happens to be Black or the humanist that is both a humanist and Black or the Black digital humanist, which I see those things as interchangeable, not interchangeable, inseparable. Um, so I'll, I'll stop talking for a second. I'll leave this up so that you can see it. But I'd love for about two or three minutes for you all to think about these two questions. At the risk of hogging the conversation, I just want oh, okay. to, <laughs> I just want to point to the the unevenness of expectations and in, in, even in in our framing of the situation. It is the mm. expectation that black scholars yeah. have to go the extra mile and do this kind of work. Uh, However, when we talk about other scholars who are working in service to Black studies, yeah. these same kind of expectations are not put on them. Therefore, and, and it, it severely restricts the, uh, the ability of Black scholars who are ethically grounded in this way, mm -hmm. um, in ways that oftentimes means it translates to people who are not Black doing work in Black studies, uh, often receiving far more grant support, more resources and the like to be able to do their work because their work is more legible in the traditional fields that are not 
uh, intentionally responsible to the Black communities and the ethical guidelines that, that guide Black scholars. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's so much more I want to say on that, and I don't have time, but Jacinta, you are absolutely right, right? So that in this, this uh, conversation about legibility, uh, the conversation about the, what counts in the academy or what counts as being more substantive, often the work that we do is not going to count for as, as much. I mean, I'll be fully honest with you. I could have a second book uh, out right now. I could have written my first book earlier, could have written a second book earlier, but a lot of my work was so invested in digital humanities and then um, black community, especially these last couple of years with COVID. I was supposed to have the second book out by now, but I chose deliberately not to do that because I was trying to make my work speak to black communities in a way that didn't lend itself to sitting, you know, in, in my office and writing all the time. It just didn't, you know, and, and I live with those choices. And luckily, you know, uh, you know, I'm working in a, a department on Africana studies that recognized those choices that I made and saw value in them. But a lot of institutions don't, right? A lot of institutions will not. And so the work that we do um, doesn't sort of show up in some of the same ways that a lot of our white counterparts or people who are working uh, in Black studies, but I love what you said, don't have the same sort of ethics or are not as ethically grounded to Black communities in the way that um, so many of us are. So I, mean, I think you just said that so beautifully. Um, and so there are costs for that. So the unevenness of that you know, I, um, I have a colleague who always talks about the black tax, right, of what it means to be black. And it, I think it changes, over, well, it obviously changes over time. So the black tax and the burden, quote, burden of being black in 1930 is definitely going to be different than uh, 2022, but nonetheless, it's still there, right? Um, and so the black tax of the scholar is often due to this invisible labor that goes unrewarded by the academy. Um, and we, you know, we get our flowers, hopefully, in other places. So thank you for that. Other thoughts? I'd love to hear a couple other people as we, you know, I'm getting a little bit downtime. I want to get these other parts of this in, so I may go over a couple minutes, but I would love to hear from a couple other people if they're willing. Um, I'd like to just comment on, on your use of the word Black epistemologies. Um, I hadn't thought about the fact that, you know, when I look at a text, a historical text, that I am bringing with it my own lens of interpretation. And I really noticed that when I was working with a white historian um, who was looking at some of these historical documents here in Lawrence, and some of what I thought were the most obvious things about, you know, Black middle class culture that she was missing. Um, and I realized this was second nature to me. Mm -hmm. you know, just being able to, to read what wasn't printed and to understand some of the, the, um, the text, the, the context yeah. um, for the documents. And so um, I've just kind of taken that information for granted, but I realized I really need to write down yes. what this knowledge is that I'm bringing to the text, to record it, um, to push against, you know, folks who, who, who aren't thinking contextually and broadly and whose jobs as historians you would think would be to think in these very deep and complex ways. And so I just really appreciate that um, that terminology. It really helps me to think about how to label um, these interactions and experiences of, of working with just different kinds of scholars and working with text that I take for granted. Um, and so I, I thank you for that. Uh, that's very helpful. No, and I, um, I appreciate the feedback on that. And what I would like to just sort of put out there is that um, I, I would imagine someone sitting here listening to this conversation might say someone outside of Black studies, Africana studies, someone who's non-Black might say, well, yeah, that that's the case with anybody coming from a, a particular cultural perspective. You know, until you're an insider, you're not going to see certain things. And, and that's a fair critique and that's a fair comment. But what I would urge you and others um, to just expand or that would, what I would tell that person is, and you know, this is my perspective. I do think there's something very distinct about a Black epistemology from the Black lived experience where you're living in a, a, a world that was created by white people for white people 
um, to fundamentally subjugate Black people, there's a certain reading that Black people are socialized to have reading of everyday encounters, reading of texts, right? We are socialized to uh, read against the grain in these very nuanced and specific ways that aren't a part of the broader culture uh, and part of just being in a different culture, right? It, you know, obviously we can talk about double consciousness and that goes into it, but I do think there's a live of Black epistemology that we come to the scholarship with. We're trained, right, um, to read text and, and do research and be historians and humanists. But there's a lived Black experience that is a very power epistemology that we often come into these spaces with that allow us to see things very, very uh, clearly and quickly in ways that our white counterparts aren't and have a certain level of critique that, uh, you know, that I wouldn't trade anything for, right? It's a certain uh, habitus or a uh, way of seeing the world that I think is essential to, to Blackness and, and a value of Blackness. Right, um, I, I so agree with that. And I would say that what's happening is that it's not, it's, it's based on lived experience, but we're not just speaking from experience. We're in dialogue with, with the theories and the principles of how, yeah. how, um, how the academy works. And yeah. so what we're saying is, yeah you know, it's interspersed and in dialogue with, with, with theory. And that's what makes it valuable. It's not just like, well, from my personal experience, right, right. Not personal right, experience. Right. Yeah. it's much deeper than that. And yeah. I think that that's one of the things that's um, really, um, for me, exciting to, to realize and to document so that yeah. other people know that this isn't just me talking from my, my lived experience. This is right. me talking through theory. Oh, I love it. I love it. And that's a great segue into the last few things I want to talk about, which um, uh, I'm going to just sort of walk you through something that you might do um, as a instructor, either with your students or yourself, as you're thinking about teaching, you know, Black digital humanities or our Black digital praxis, right? So this is, um, you know, I'm an old school, middle school, high school teacher. That's really where I started my educational uh, sort of trajectory, teaching middle school and high school. So, you know, I, I, I learned how to do lesson planning and think about learning and design. And then I have a master's degree in learning and design technology. But this understanding by design is actually an approach to learning that many uh, teachers in middle school, high school use it. So part of what I'm showing you here is part of that practice of, of understanding by design. Um, and so one of the ways that you might start thinking about how to start designing learning or pedagogy about the Black digital collection or Black digital practice is a, a really quick activity that you might do with your students or yourself is, you know, if you're going to dinner um, and you are going to have dinner with uh, people dead or alive, and you're going to talk about Black digital publishing or Black digital collections or Black digital humanities, hey, who would you have to dinner and what questions would you ask to get the conversation started, sustain, encourage further inquiry? Well, you know, what I'm asking you is to think about the big question about Black digital humanities, about Black digital collection building, about what it means to recover uh, humanities through the Black digital humanities? What are the big questions and the big enduring understandings that you want to impart either through your work or even with students and teaching them about this work? Um, and what are and these essential questions when you develop them, you know, they should be questions that have more than one answer or no simple answer. They should spark debate. They should spark discussion. They should raise other questions or provoke further inquiry. How can you stimulate through these essential questions, these concepts about Black epistemologies, right? About a certain Black lived experience in conversation with theory? What are these principles and ideas and assumptions that are made about Black people and Blackness that go into these larger questions about Black DH and Black uh, um, digital publishing and recovery, right? And again, thinking about this um, dinner party, um, this says African American studies, but I it should say Black DH. You know, what are the understandings about Black DH that you expect you and your guests to gain? What types of misconceptions do you want to clear up? So, in value, you just talked about how um, you know people are like, well, that's just your perspective, or you know, that's just your opinion about being a Black person. How do you clear up these misconceptions about? Uh, a black epistemologies or help clarify them as a real theory that can be used to deepen people's knowledge and understanding. Um, and then 
when you how you translate that into what we might call as knowledge and skills or learning objectives is then what exactly are the skills, the texts, the things that people need to be able to do or know in order to answer that big question. So when you're thinking about designing pedagogy or learning around Black DH or Black um, digital publishing or Black collection building, you know, you want to start out with a big, enduring, big question, big idea, and then start working down, like, what are the specific knowledge and skills? What do people need to do or be able to know to start thinking about that larger question that they can engage in in conversations, right? So if we're thinking of Black, you know, Black digital collection building, well, we need to know about Schomburg, right? We need to know about Dorothy Porter Wesley. We need to know about Dr. Graham. We need to know about their practices and their approaches to building collections and their understanding of Blackness in order to start getting at these larger, bigger questions of recovery, right? Um, and so that, you know, is one way to start building a pedagogy, which I think is really the next big place that we really need to go in Black DH. I certainly have been remiss in, um, you know, really taking the things that I've been thinking about and moving from theory and praxis, which I, I think, you know, I have a theoretical sort of basis and a praxis of basis when I start building my Black digital projects, but I haven't really brought that into a Black DH pedagogy. And I think we need to really start thinking about how we convey this work to students um, and help them to be a part of disrupting, disrupting these Eurocentric ideas about what it means to work with technology in the build with technology. So I'll stop sharing um, and see if there are any questions. And again, um, I'll share the slide deck with you all. I know that this will be recorded and then um, that will allow you to go back and um, you know, clarify or, or re-listen to things that you might've missed. Uh, we didn't get to the Dotson one, so you, will that be included with your? Yes, yes, the whole Dotson uh, conversation. Uh, I will say uh, in this small group that um, the conversation with Dr. Graham was a little bit more collaborative and dialogue. Um, it's been my experience. I'll just say it. I'm at an age where I'm going to just say what I feel. I tend to do uh, conversations with men tend to be more about themselves often, and so you'll hear that with Mr. Dotson, as great as his work was, a lot of it is about him. Whereas um, Dr. Graham was sharing about the work and the significance of the work. Dr. Dotson, I mean, Mr. Dotson does the same thing, but I welcome you to listen to the conversation because there are definitely gems in that. So, um, and Dr. Graham, I haven't shared that, that our conversation with anyone else. I probably should have asked you before I shared it here, but. Uh, you know, even listening to it again, every time I hear that exchange between us, I'm just light bulbs are going up, but that was throughout the whole conversation. But um, let me just say, y'all, Dr. Graham, if, you know, the fact that y'all have worked with her, you're in conversation with her, she's one of a kind. That's all I will say, you know, just, uh, I'll, again, I'll say people will be writing books and works about her 100 years from now. Um, so I don't think she gets enough flowers in this moment, but um, you know, sometimes people have to leave before we recognize them. But I wanted to say to everyone, she is one of the most brilliant, innovative, generous, generous scholars I know, and just a wonderful person. For that, you know, I deeply, deeply value, cherish, and love her. Well, um, at this point, I know we're all uh, um, busy and, and probably have to move forward, but I do want to encourage all of you to reach out to me directly. Um, if you want to talk, if you have questions, I definitely know um, I have Jacinta I'm reaching out to because I wanted to hear more about this bestsellers list. I'm, I'm writing this book on um, Book of a Muff Club in Baltimore in the 1930s and 40s as a, as a chapter. So also thinking about how Black people create their own sort of bestsellers, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Amanda, I want to talk to you about um, uh, the Black feminism, TikTok, um, and uh, who else? Uh, Crystal, I didn't really get to hear, you came in last, and Belia's gone. Uh, Sandra and Coco want to reach out to you. Kirsten, I see you on Twitter all the time. So I uh, know I can connect with you there, just since I see you sometimes. Uh, on there. <laughs> Kirsten, I see you a lot on Twitter, right? Yes, I do. I've been, I've been taking a step back from Twitter. 
Um, so it can be a lot sometimes, but um, either way, it's been really, really wonderful to be in conversation with all of you. And um, I look forward to seeing you in some shape, form or fashion in the very, very near future. Mm -hmm. All right, bye-bye.